Hi, Lighthouse family. Though it has only been two weeks since we gather here in this chapel uh, for our Sunday worship, it feels like it's been months. Um, and, that, and, and I really miss gathering with you for our Sunday worship in person. But at the same time, I'm very, very thankful uh, for the technology and the wonderful members of our church family um, who have been working tirelessly to help us continue to gather for worship in spirit using our online platform. Now, before we dive into God's Word today, I think we need to just take a moment to pause or slow down and take a deep breath because we all had a very long, uh, full week. Having to juggle work, school, some of you younger children at home, and taking care of elderly parents, and so on, I'm sure you have had a really, really long week. On the one hand, some of you have been busier than ever before as a result of this current situation, while there are some of our church family members who are part of Lighthouse who have been concerned about the ever-mounting financial loss as well as even, or even the possibility of losing your job. And I think it is no overstatement to say that we are dealing with an unprecedented challenge, not just here in our country or in our city or in our, um, in our, in our state, but around the globe. So here's a question uh, that I've been asking. How should we as God's people deal with the current situation, current crisis, and what difference does our faith in God as God's people make in a difficult situation like this? In a climate of great uncertainty and growing anxiety, it is, it is easy for us to give in to the same fear that we see so many of us around, uh, so, many, so many people around us are falling victim to. But church, we don't have to give in to the same fear. Instead, as we learned last week, if you remember, God's people can choose joy even in the midst of our trials. Not because of our trials, but because of our God who is in control of everything. Even when things around us seem to be spinning out of control. And if there was ever a time where it feels like things are spinning out of control, probably there has never been a time like this before. And because we know that our God who is in control of everything can and will use everything which is under his reign, under his control, uh, to bring about good, um, not only for the people who love him, but for the good of the world that he loves through uh, his people. We don't have to lose hope. We don't have to give in to fear. Now today, uh, we are going to talk about temptations as we look at the next section in James chapter 1. And here's why James talks about temptation as he talks about trials. When we face trials, our hearts and minds become more vulnerable to temptations than when things are calm or well with us. It's kind of like when you're living under constant stress, your immune system gets compromised and weaken, and you become more vulnerable to the same germs or diseases that you are able to fight off easily. In a similar way, when we face trials like the ones that we are all dealing with right now in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, our hearts and minds become more vulnerable to different temptations that are otherwise not as tempting under better circumstances. And that's why James, in our passage, warns us to watch out for temptations and also shows us how to deal with temptations in the midst of our trials. First, let's turn to God's word in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. Let me read that passage, and if you do have your Bible with you, Please follow along. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it, is, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, 
And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. So again, the question is this, how should we as God's people deal with temptations in the midst of our trials? And here in our passage, there are two important ways through which God, through James, his writing, calls us to overcome our temptation in the midst of our trials. The first thing that James says that we must do is to fight the lie. Fight the lie. Now, before I get to that, let me just point out a few things about temptations that James mentions here in our passage that we read today. The first thing he says here is temptation does not come from God. Right? When, when bad things happen, sometimes, if we, especially if we have done something that we know was against God's will, and when bad things happen, sometimes we, uh, we, we, we ask ourselves, hey, is it God punishing me for what I did? Right? But it says, temptation does not come from God. Here's what James says in verse 13. Let no one say when, he is, when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So temptation does not come from God. And second, he says being tempted is not sin in itself. Here in our passage, he dis- differentiates between being tempted, right, temptation, and the sin that temptation can lead to. So being tempted alone or in itself is not the same thing as committing sin. Why? Because we can't control what is outside or what comes from outside. And God understands that. But at the same time, James warns us, we should not take temptation lightly. Why? Because temptation can very quickly and easily, almost effortlessly turn into sin especially when we are under a lot of stress, like many of us are right now as we're going through this trial. And in verses 14 through 15, James describes the progressive nature of how temptation really works uh, in our hearts using this imagery of a pregnant woman conceiving, nurturing, and giving birth to a child. Here's what it says. Let me read it to you. In verses 14 through 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What's the point that James is making here with this imagery? James is, James is using this metaphor of pregnant mother to remind us that there is a choice that we need to make. Just like that woman, right? A woman has to make a choice to conceive. There's a choice we have to make when we are tempted. Temptation does not automatically cause us to sin, though it can lead to sin. So there's a choice that we, may, we, we need to make or we, we have to make. And then second thing is our choice has a consequence. Just like a pregnant lady, right, after carrying a child, nurturing and carrying a child for months, in the end, gives birth to a child. Our choice has a consequence. Now, I, I doubt that anyone here today or anyone who is listening or watching this needed to be reminded of this obvious truth. Even a two- or three-year-old child knows this, that there is a consequence to our choice. But simply knowing that our choice has, and, and, and also simply knowing that our choice has a consequence does not help us to resist or overcome our temptation, right? We know this from our own experience, personal experience. It's not that... I don't know there's a consequence for overeating, for example. Like, I know I'm going to see it the next moment, if not the next day. So simply knowing that our choice has a consequence does not keep us from uh, succumbing or giving in to that temptation which leads to sin that hurts us and hurts others. Now let's talk about temptations. Let's talk about your life. What are some of the temptations that have been triggered by this just continuing, ensuing season of uncertainty and anxiety. 
For some of you, the temptation triggered by this, this current crisis might be worrying constantly. Right? As you're looking at the updates on your phone or, or the news or social media, right? you, you've been just constantly worrying. Now, that is, I'm not saying that we should not be concerned. We should. And one of the reasons why we are doing an online church instead of gathering together in person during this crisis is because we want to be a, a, a loving neighbor or we want to love our neighbors who are more vulnerable uh, than we are, perhaps. And that's why we are not uh, gathering together as a way of taking precaution. We're taking the situation seriously, and we should. But then that is different from constantly worrying Constantly worrying about the situation. So maybe that is your temptation. For others, it might be apathy. This is not the polar opposite of constantly worrying. Maybe it's apathy. You just, you just don't want to care anymore because it's just too much for you to think about. And for others, it might be eating or drinking or looking at things that you know that you shouldn't be. Right? This current stress uh, in this trial might be triggering uh, th- those temptations and causing you to, to look to other things. And for others, it might be overeating. Maybe it's not what you're eating, but how much. And, and to be honest, this, this one is a huge one for me because gluten in our culture is, is one of those more acceptable sins that people seem to be okay. We make light of, including me. But the, but the truth is, it does not make its consequence any less harmful to me or to other people around me. Now, here is what James wants us to know about temptation, which is the key to overcoming temptations. With every temptation that I just mentioned, and many more, whatever your temptations that are triggered by your stress, uh, as you're going through trials, might be, right? With every temptation that I just mentioned and more, There is a great lie that lurks behind. So what is that lie that lurks behind every temptation? It is this lie that says, God is not good. God is not good. And that's why James says what he says in verses 16 through 17 in our passage. After he first warns us about the danger of temptations or giving into temptation, then he goes on to say what we read in verses 16 through 17. Let me read to you. He says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, meaning from God, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You see, the reason why we give in to temptations in, in, as, as we're in the midst and the thick of trials that puts our, our, our minds and our hearts at, at utmost stress is because we don't really believe in that moment in the midst of our trials that God really cares and God will really do something about the situation. Despite our confession that God is good and we believe in God, And that's why we either worry too much or stop caring altogether instead of trusting that God will provide because he is good. And that's why we turn to other things that I mentioned earlier, whether it be food or substance or things that you shouldn't be looking at, instead of turning to God for help. You know, I heard someone once say that the definition of Christian is not just somebody who merely believes in God, but someone who believes that God is good or believe in a good God. Just think about that. Merely believing in God does not necessarily make us a Christian in a biblical sense because it all depends on who that God we believe in is, right? The picture and the view of God is. Is it really shaped by the, the truth that is revealed in his word, as well as reveal in the work, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, only when we choose to believe in God, who is good, we are able to fight the lie, which is a key, which is a key to overcoming temptations 
that lead to painful consequences that hurt us and hurt those around us. So I want us to think about how we've been coping with this current crisis. Whether you're stuck at home or at work or in between, I want us to just take a moment to just reflect on how we've been coping and dealing with current crisis, the situation at hand. Would you say that it reflects or contradicts what we confess with our mouth about God, that God is good, that God is sovereign? You see, what we confess with our mouth is important, but it's not always what we really believe in. We can confess a lot of things without truly believing in what we are confessing. So I want us to really think about that. And if you need some help engaging where, how you've been navigating through this, just ask the people that you are around at home with, especially if you have families, especially if you have teenagers. They're not shy to tell you like it is. And would people, so would people around us at home and at work say that there is something different about how we are dealing with the current crisis as God's people? Or would they say, there's no real difference that I see in them? I know they go to church. I know they believe in God. But I don't really see any difference in terms of how they're dealing with it. They seem just as stressed. They seem just as anxious. They're a part of that crowd that are lining up outside Costco, forming a huge line, even though they already have two weeks' worth of food to feed themselves and even perhaps their neighbors. Just, just caving into that panic that everyone has been caving into. By the way, I, I'm not asking this question to give anyone a guilt trip here, but to point us back to that simple truth about our God, that God is good. God, our God is good. And I often have to remind myself of this simple truth that Paul speaks of in Romans 8.32. Here's what it says. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I mean, Paul puts it in a rhetorical fashion. And we all know what rhetorical question is. It's the question that has an obvious answer. You don't even have to answer because the answer is already assumed. The answer is, of course, God will give us all that we need if he has already demonstrated his love, the extent of his love, by giving up his only son for us. So the first thing that we must do to overcome our temptation, especially as we're going through trials, is to fight the lie that says God is not good. Fight the lie that God is not good. Now there's one more thing that James talks of in this passage. And that one more thing is this. We must fix our eyes on unchanging God in our ever-changing situation. If we want to really get through this, right, without giving into those triggers of temptations or temptations that are triggered by our trials, right, if we want to get through this as God's people in the way that God wants us to, we must fix our eyes on unchanging God in the midst of our ever-changing circumstances. Now, not all changes are bad. I think we, we already know that, right? In fact, some changes are not only good but are necessary, like changing a bad habit into a good one or, or getting a haircut like I did to look, look pretty for you today, right? Not all changes are bad. Some changes are necessary. But at the same time, there are certain changes in life that we wish wouldn't change because those changes bring about pain, it, 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 yeah, it brings pain and discouragement. Like certain close relationships that you used to have with your friends that have grown apart over the years. Or departure of our loved ones due to aging or illness. 
which we know is inevitable, but it doesn't make it any less painful. Or being betrayed by the very people that you thought were your friends. And the list can go on and on about the types of changes that we wish we could stop, but we can't. But unlike everything else in life that is bound to change, for better or for worse, there is one who does not and will not change, as James reminds us in this passage. And that is our God and his unchanging goodness toward his children. Let me read verse 17 to you, especially the second verse, uh, second part of that verse 17. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Again, God is good, right? But then he goes on to say, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There is no variation or shadow due to change. You know, more than ever before, we are all painfully aware of the stress of having to deal with ever-changing circumstances around this. And it's been exhausting, hasn't it? And it it would be very easy for us to get sucked into the same fear and anxiety that many people around us are falling or have fallen victim to. But we don't have to. But we don't have to. We can stay calm by fixing our eyes on God, who is not only good, as James reminds us, but God, whose goodness toward us does not change. Does not change. You know, it seems like such a, it's it's such a simple truth, but this simple truth makes all the difference whether we simply know this truth or we really believe and live each day, each moment out of this truth, it makes all the difference. And I love how James ends this section of his letter, parts of his letter in verse 18, by reminding us of this, again, simple but life-changing truth, life-giving truth. He says this, of his own will, speaking of God, of his own own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures James is saying this hey we didn't choose God but God chose us this is of his own will right in in Romans 5 8 Paul says the same truth in different way he says God demonstrates his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we didn't choose God. God chose us and he has made us the first fruits, meaning he has given us a new birth as children of God so that we no longer have to live as orphans, the helpless orphans in this world, in this broken world. But we have God as our heavenly father who is good, And whose goodness never changes. And who can accomplish good even through all the trials that we will face. So Lighthouse family, as we continue to navigate the season marked with great uncertainty and escalating anxiety, let's be God's church by loving one another and loving our neighbors with the love of Christ and the confidence of our God, who is good and whose goodness is unchanging. You know, before I close, I have uh, just a few quick announcements uh, for our church family. Uh, First, I would love uh, to invite all of you to join us for our Thursday prayer meeting, uh, virtually through Zoom. Uh, You could go on to our homepage, uh, www.lighthousedfw.org, and and there's a link uh, for you to download the Zoom app if you don't already have it. And you can join us. Just call in uh, for our prayer meeting uh, every Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, we, we just tried that this past week, and it was a great time 
of encouragement, mutual encouragement and reminder that we are not and we don't have to go through this alone, not only because we have God, our Heavenly Father, but God has also given us the gift of his family. He has brought us into his family. As, we've, as I've shared with you thoroughly before, maybe now it's becoming a nagging uh, almost. And the second uh, announcement, or, or yeah, second thing that I want to share with you is more of a challenge and invitation to any of you who is not yet part of a community group. You know, to be honest, as your pastor, the ones that I've been praying uh, harder um, and, and have been more concerned about are those of you who are not part of a community groups here at Lighthouse. Because God never promised that we will be able to get through our trials on our own. Not even with God. God always provides his gift of his word, right? But also he gives us, he has given us the gift of his family by virtue of being brought into, brought, brought in Christ, by being born again through Christ, our faith in Christ. We have already become a part of God's family. And more than ever before, I want to really encourage you those who are not yet walking with other members of this family here at Lighthouse, to join with others and, and go through this season as a family. And now that many of you don't have choice but to stay home in the evening hours, maybe more than ever before, you now have an opportunity to really uh, examine how you've been walking with God and with one another here in the family of God here at Lighthouse. So I want to really encourage you and challenge you and invite you to be part of a community group. And if, you, if you're interested in starting one or being part of starting a new one, uh, please let me know. Uh, so if you're either interested in joining one or starting or being part of it, starting a new uh, community group, please email me uh, and you can... Uh, find out my email address on the website as well. So church, let's continue to uh, be God's church, God's people living on God's mission of restoring the hope uh, in this broken world. More than ever before, we have an incredible opportunity to really point people uh, to Christ and the hope and the confidence that we can only have because of Christ and our relationship with God as our Heavenly Father through Christ. Have a great week of worship. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are not only God of all creation who is in control of all that goes on in the world that you created and you love, but you are our Heavenly Father who loves us with an unchanging love. Yet it is easy for our mind to become preoccupied with worries and distractions that cause us to forget this truth about you, our Father. So Holy Spirit, we need your help to guard our hearts against the lie that says God is not good, especially when things look and feel bad. Would you help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus through whom our Heavenly Father has demonstrated his unchanging love and commitment toward us as our Heavenly Father. We also ask for your protection upon us, especially those who are most vulnerable financially, physically, and spiritually. We also ask for your continued healing upon Elliot, as well as all those who have been affected by the current COVID-19, not just in our city, but around the globe. In the coming days, would you show us how to continue to be your church? That is your people living on your mission of restoring this broken world that you love by pointing people to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ and by serving them with the love of Christ. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.